Welcome to Conversations with Healers, a podcast and video interview series that features intimate, soulful, and cozy conversations with self-healers and healers. Healer to healer, we dive into all aspects of self-healing and healing and being and becoming a healer. I am Damla Aktekin. I am a healer and the host of this podcast, and I can't wait for you to listen to this conversation. Hello, everyone. This is Damla Aktekin with A Drop of Om. And I have here with me a very special guest that I'm so excited about. Uh, this is Ginny Jablonski. And Ginny is an intuitive healer, animal communicator, horse medicine facilitator, and we'll dive deeper into all of these. Um, Ginny, you're also an inspirational speaker, author, and opioid crisis advocate. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm yeah. very excited to talk with you. I am too. And I want to tell people, first of all, how I found you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always on the lookout for people who inspire me in the healing space. And I, have a, um, I also have the habit of just opening tabs on my laptop or on my iPhone. <laughs> and I had a tab open with your website on my iPhone for weeks. And I, I didn't get around to it. And then finally, one day I'm in my room, I opened your, your website. Um, and I'm just reading and I'm like, wow, this is a wonderful um, story, a wonderful healing. Um, you know, I'm getting all these inspirations and ideas. And then I'm listening to you talk about, <laughs> you have this 10 minute or 13 minute intro introduction to your healing sessions. And it's not that, you know, it, it's not that dramatic. You're basically laying it out. And then my husband walks in and he looks at me, he's like, why are you crying? And I hadn't realized up to that point that I had been crying, but it wasn't that I was upset or anything, but it was just such a, almost like a remembrance with you. Um, and I really wanted to chat with you. So thank you for coming here. Tell, tell us about um, your self-healing journey. I know you have an extraordinary story and your journey of becoming a healer. Well, I never anticipated this at all in any way. I never would have considered myself a healer material. Um, I carried a gun for a living. I was in international security and I became quite ill. And over uh, time, my health declined and uh, the doctors were unable to diagnose me. And of course, from the onset, they wanted to put me on opioids or narcotics and I declined the narcotics for about seven years. Eventually, I had to retire, take an early medical retirement. And at a certain point on my journey around 2008 or 2009, I just gave in and said, okay, I'm not improving and nothing else seems to be helping. So I went ahead and I took the opioids. And that's a very slippery slope, as, as we all know. And a few years later, I uh, accidentally overdosed on the prescription medication uh, that was fentanyl, and I had a near-death experience. And following the near-death experience, um, the likes of which I had never even heard of, let alone uh, understood, uh, I went on a journey of really trying to figure out what happened to me. Like a lot of people who have near-death experiences, we've never heard of it. We don't understand why it happened to us. We, um, you know, you search for the meaning of life. You visit sacred sites. You start to study any, you buy spiritual books. You study any modality you can get your hands on, um, spending money hand over fist as I did. Um, following my near-death experience, two things were, were really uh, for in the forefront of my consciousness. And number one, I didn't want to die. I came back from the near-death experience because I wanted to live and I felt that I had something to do, something important to do. 
Um, I don't know if I've found that thing yet. <laughs> um, it, it may just be, you know, for all of us, the expression of our purpose. And, and then secondly, um, I wanted to get myself off of, of opioids and, and heal myself and to understand the gifts and abilities that I immediately manifested after my near-death experience. I could see energy. I perceive almost in layers of consciousness. So um, some people talk about uh, perceiving everything as one, the personality, the, the higher self, you know, the body, it's all one energy. I perceive it quite differently. I perceive it in layers. And therefore, I, I feel that I can perceive the ways in which different energies, emotions, pain, trauma, events um, affect our energy construct and affect our, the chemical processes in our brain and our heart and affect our, our, the functioning of our physical body. But I didn't know any of that. I had never read a spiritual book in my life. And um, somebody, like a friend took me to a spiritual bookstore once and I got the, a reading and the hangman card came up, the death card, and I went running. <laughs> you know, little did I know, roughly 15 years later, I would have that near-death experience. But that was my only uh, experience with a, a spiritual bookstore was yeah. turning over the death card. <laughs> yeah. So um, I had a lot to learn. and. Um, I was so willing to listen to anybody. I really, truly just wanted to heal and wanted to live. And um, so I traveled quite a bit and I studied a, a number of different philosophies, but I was always compelled um, not to just take what, like just focus on pranic healing or Hindu philosophy or the Tao, or Chinese medicine, or um, Kabbalah, or New Age mysticism. It, I, I was very interested, I was compelled to understand what I was seeing and experiencing. I wasn't necessarily fascinated with the teachings. So it's hard to say which came first for a lot of people. And for me, it was, I had the visions and I knew things I shouldn't know, but I didn't understand the terminology. I didn't understand the religious or spiritual context. I didn't understand the history. And I certainly didn't understand how energy works. And I also didn't understand how many different energy constructs exist in a human how many religions we have all expressed in the past, how many spiritual philosophies that have their own energetic construct. And I came to find out that I was seeing so many different types of energy all at once. And what eventually happened after I really set an intention, and I think what did it for me was a book by Marianne Williamson called Illuminata. It's a, just a book of prayers. Prayers for the victims, prayers for the perpetrators, prayers for the parents, the children, the, um, the, the African, you know, the slaves, the um, uh, people who suffered in World War II, uh, you know, all, all types of prayers, prayers for the earth, prayers for nature, prayers for the animals, etc. And I read the book and I was so enthralled with the book. I just was so moved by the prayers that when I finished the book, I had all these little yellow post-it notes on all the pages. And so I'm holding the book one night and I'm like, well, what do I do now? Because I had another pile of like 30 books I had purchased, but I didn't understand any of them. You know, it was talking about chakras and um, shamanism and just all different types of healing. and nothing really resonated with me because I didn't, I had no idea what any of it was. And I really just was so enthralled with this book. And so I promised myself that I would just read these prayers. I'd choose a few prayers every night and read the prayers. And that's what I did for about six months. Every night for about a half an hour or so, I just read prayers out loud. And I feel like that 
was as you and I would set an intention prior to any healing session, as we did prior to this conversation, it's almost as if I set the intention for my life, for my healing journey by just reading these and not just reading the words of the prayers, but really embodying the true desire for all beings to be healed, for all people to forgive one another, for the earth to be brought into balance and for humans to be brought into balance, not only with one another, but with the planet. It's making me cry. Yeah, and I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do, does that make sense? It was like yeah. a six month long, you know, setting an intention and telling the universe and telling my soul, I'm ready. I'm here. I'm showing up. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, I had no idea what that meant. You know, I always tell um, my clients that I work with, you know, I climbed Mount Karma and I live to tell about it, <laughs> you know, because a lot of us are here and we're just like, we're just going to get it all done in this life. We're going to resolve all our karma. It's going to be a piece of cake, you know, and it wasn't so much a piece of cake, <laughs> but um, the way that things unfolded and the people that I met and the different groups that I became involved with, whether it was just meditation or education or um, certain different uh, specializing in certain healing modalities, I met amazing people all over the world. I went to Australia and I worked with Aborigines. I worked with shaman from Brazil, shaman from Siberia, a Mayan shaman, a Costa Rican shaman, a Peruvian shaman, you know, and that is not to say that I am in any way an expert or a master of any of these things that I am mentioning. I have become acquainted with. It's almost like I reached out. I just shook hands and said, hello. And I learned enough to explain what I was seeing energetically with respect to that energy construct that um, is related. For example, um, the Lemurians, the Hawaiians express a different energy construct than the New Zealand Maori, than the Mayan, than the uh, than Shinto, than the Taoist, than the Buddhist, than in Kabbalah, it's a little bit different, but a, more in alignment with the new age mysticism, et cetera. And so for me, what I did was I, I, I took in everything like a sponge and in the beginning, I just believed everything anybody told me, oh, that's how the universe works. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then it would get to a point where it seemed a little, um, oppressive or a little, um, stifling. And somehow I was like, no, I, th I think I need to learn. There's more for me to know. And so I would say, thank you very much. And I would move on to the next thing and learn the next thing. And always with these being guided by visions and by experiencing different people. And on the journey, I, of course, worked with a lot of healers because I had been, you know, I had Lyme disease, neurological Lyme disease, a lot of um, osteo arthritis, degenerative joint, and um, disc disease, and that types of things. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so, um, but I also had a lot of trauma in my life. So I tried on healing modalities, like you change your clothes every day, you know, and, and, and that's not to say really that had I not just stuck with one healing modality that I might not have um, been able to go further on my healing journey, that wasn't the point, I don't think, for me. The, the point, the purpose of my journey for me was learning what worked and what didn't work or what I resonated with at the time um, for me on my journey overcoming trauma and PTSD and abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. And it, and it took a long time, but luckily I didn't work. So it's not as if I just did like you know, three weekend workshops or something in a year, every weekend I was learning, traveling, going somewhere, doing something, you know, and, um, but spirit kept showing me more. And when I would work with the healers, there would always be something that I would gift back to them, you know, oh, I think you had a past life or, oh, I, you know, you might need to heal the same thing that I'm healing, <laughs> you know, and of course, in the beginning, you know, the energy um, conduit 
is wide open. And so you have to, on your journey, you have to figure out how to regulate that. You have to you, learn to use your discernment. You have to um, put boundaries around what you see and when you see and what's appropriate for you to know and what's not appropriate for you to know. You know, it's quite a, a learning journey and really humbling, but in a really exciting way. Um, I don't think I had any uh, too terribly negative experiences and, and I don't feel like I ever brought any harm to anyone. Um, but I might have maybe known something that someone preferred that I didn't know about them. Um, you know, to be honest, in the beginning, you're just seeing and knowing it's, it's as if points of light and information are just everywhere. Um, or at least that was my experience. Uh, I've been told that when I came back, it was almost as if there were no boundaries. So we, uh, a lot of people talk about in our evolution, as we evolve as, as humans, we won't be able to lie to one another anymore, right? We won't be able, I won't be able to hide my trauma from you and you won't be able to hide your trauma from me because there'll be a knowing. And the, the boundaries between um, our unique identity begin to fade away as we intentionally choose to return to the oneness. And when I came back from my near-death experience, it was like that. And it was a little inappropriate for the time. So I was, it was a fine line really of walking and, and learning, um, you know, ethical um, practices and, um, and, and, and uh, energy management practices for myself and learning how to clear myself and ground. Um, but eventually it got to a point where people were asking me to, to heal them. And I didn't really consider myself a healer, even at that point. This is maybe around 2013, 2014. And I felt a lot of these people had studied for 20, 25, 30 years. And, you know, I hadn't studied that long. I just sort of woke up from a dream one day and knew stuff. And it didn't seem, it didn't seem like um, I could legitimately charge money for giving a few messages that, see, you know, seemed very helpful. But I just didn't understand how powerful and impactful it was. Um, again, because I had so little experience with this, and uh, so that's how it all started. Where I started healing the healers that were healing me, and then they started referring me to their clients. And pretty soon, I was on the phone with clients all over the world, you know, like eight or ten hours a day. <laughs> and my own healing journey got a little sidetracked, and so I had to sort of take a step back and refocus on me, and just take a few clients a day. And then uh, as I began in a much more balanced way to work with people, it was almost as if every single person was sent to me for some really special reason. Like they experienced something that was so similar to something that I had experienced and overcome, healed, released, forgiven, right? And I was, I was able to say, oh my gosh, that... I had that same experience or that same energy, and this is what I did. And here are six other things I tried, <laughs> you know, and four of them didn't really work for me, but two of them kind of worked. And so you pick which one works for you. And so I'm, I'm able to give um, not just one answer to, to people. Does, it, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Oh my and goodness. Then, Jenny, I'm just going to cut in a little bit because this is fascinating to me. Um, so I, I, I keep coming back to the six months. By the way, I'm in the process of learning, beginning to learn tarot. And I love that actually you got the hangman and the death. And contrary to common belief, that is actually, it symbolizes a huge deep change mm -hmm. which I feel like I mean alongside the near that experience right. <laughs> the physical but it seems to me that you know that's part of it and the hanged man actually sort of simplifies this in between state it this it's um often referred to as divine delay like there's sort of a becoming in the process of change so I love that and I love the six months you describe of like just dedicated prayer like dedicated offering of you know talking to the universe 
So I love all of these. I want to jump to, because I'm very curious about, I want to talk about people too, but tell us about your, um, how did you become interested in healing animals or animal or horse medicine? That, that is also another thing that I accidentally stumbled into. And I was just getting to that part of the story. So it's, a per, it's flowing perfectly. And so I was working with people. And as I was working with people, I would say, Domla, do you, do you have a cat? Do you have a white cat? <laughs> you know? And it was as if the animals were coming in and interfering with my human sessions. And I was getting a little bit mad. <laughs> I mean, I never told the people, you know, but afterwards I'd be like, what's going on? You know, I'm trying to help these people <laughs> and their animals are coming in. And um, it happened a lot. Like I would be working with someone, I would say, do you have a horse that's alive? The horse really wants to talk to you. It's very upset about something. Or do you have a dog that passed when you were younger? And this is what it looks like. And it was all so clear. And what was happening was the animals were giving me beautiful messages and some of them were a little distressed and needed healing or wanted some attention. Um, but what happened was I was meditating one day and I was really, why are these animals bothering me? <laughs> and then um, they came in, this council of horses came in and said, don't you remember? You're supposed to be helping us. We have guided you on your journey of healing so that you can apply all that you have learned to heal human trauma to the animal kingdom, to mostly domesticated animals. And I said, wow, no, I don't remember. And then I had almost like a hypnotic, spontaneous hypnotic regressive experience where I went back into my near-death experience and, um, in my near-death experience, for me, I was a, a Methodist when I was younger, so Christian religion, Protestant Christian religion. So for me, God and heaven would be represented by Jesus. And so that's who I saw in my near-death experience. And as I started to walk toward Jesus, I heard horses and donkeys in the background just braying and whinnying and screaming, don't go, don't go don't you remember there's something important you have to do? So when I woke up in the morning from my near-death experience, I knew there was something important I had to do, but I forgot it was animals that had told me that. And in my life, I had been a horse person and, and rescued and rehabbed horses um, and always had dogs. I mean, my goodness, I've had eight or 10 dogs in my life and, you know, a few cats. Um, <clears throat> But it was then that I realized that I needed to shift my, or at least, I don't know if I realized it or I thought it, but what would be the first thing you would think is, oh, well, I better go out and educate myself how to be an animal communicator, not realizing I already was an animal communicator, right? So I tried, you know, I went and I, um, I took a few classes and what I found, just like with the energy work, was the information that the animals were was bringing through was so much broader than what traditional animal communication represented. So that's how my journey began with the animals and it just really snowballed. And I began to, to the universe sent me animals that had trauma. I almost never got somebody, oh, can you just ask my, tell my dog we're moving and you know, we're, it'll, everything's going to be fine. No, it's, I've rescued this animal. They're very distressed. They have this behavior or we've had them for three years or there've been uh, significant traumatic events in their lives, et cetera. And it's always been so fascinating and, and so perfect every client. And of course, just like with the human work, it had to evolve. I had to learn and the animals brought me the clients that were able to teach me how to work with the animals. So, yeah. In your experience, how do you see, or do you see any differences between human trauma and animal trauma or in the way that they um, show trauma compared to humans? 
Well, if you look at it from, and I don't, I am not, I don't have a PhD in psychotherapy or um, psychology. So um, am I medically qualified to discuss, you know, the way a dog's brain works or the horse's brain works? I'm unfortunately no, but I can say that I've had a lot of experience in therapy, you know, from uh, like Jungian certified uh, psychotherapy or psychotherapy from the Freudian perspective. Um, uh, Rogers in England, I've done brain spotting, Gabor, uh, Gabor Mate's um, uh, Compassionate Inquiry, uh, EFT, EMDR, you name it. I've done, you know, uh, transpersonal psychology, I've tried it all. And I have a lot of clients who are also therapists that I'm able to communicate with about, well, how would you, how would you speak about this in your terms professionally in your work? And I have um, clients that work in mental hospitals and that are priests and, and that are social workers and sociologists and anthropologists and really incredibly educated people that also teach me a lot and that in turn validate for me my journey when I say, well, this is how I perceive it in your subconscious or your conscious. They'll say, oh, well, that's exactly how we're taught in school. Um, the only thing is that I see thoughts and memories a little bit differently and the way the information is stored in the nervous system and the body, um, <clears throat> I, I see it in a, a little bit more unique way. Um, but with respect to the uh, similarities between animals and people, I would say a few things. Number one, animals also have looping thoughts so it, and this is more prevalent for domesticated animals than it would be, of course, for wild animals, because domesticated animals have been affected by the systems of belief of humanity. And our karma and our ancestral burdens have become entangled with the animals as well. So the animals can take on systems of belief. I just got off the phone earlier today with a woman whose horse was very upset because the breeder had said that he um, was unsuitable for breeding. And so they gelded him and he was no longer a stallion. And to hear that you're unsuitable to carry forward your genetic lineage is, is traumatic. And it, it would be traumatic for a person as well. Animals do, um, they do have anger, they experience anger, anxiety, fear, they have looping thoughts, uh, their nervous systems can become overrun, uh, 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 you know, overstressed, and they share a lot of things in common with humanity. Now, do they have a pre-conscious, a subconscious, a conscious, and a unconscious? I can't, I, I can't speak to that from a scientific perspective. I see all trauma, it, for the most part, as two things primarily, unresolved emotions attached to memories or, and or energies and our energetic, what a shaman would consider soul loss, where we disassociate or become fractured, or our energy or power is trapped inside of a traumatic experience, which um, continues to bring that traumatic experience forward. And if animals didn't experience trauma, there would be no behavior problems in dogs and horses. Yeah. Right, there wouldn't be aberrant behaviors. My cat showed, just showed up at the door, by the way. She's meowing, which she doesn't do normally. But anyhow, well, please let um, her, if you want to take a moment and let her sure, in. Sure, I'll please do it. She'll see if she wants to come in. <laughs> so, um, I'm fascinated by that, and, and I want to ask you about. The other piece of that, which is we often talk about um, in, you know, uh, in healing world, in terms of animals having symbolic representations of wisdom. So um, calling things like cat medicine or horse medicine, 
what if you animals are and domesticated animals in particular are here to teach us what is their medicine for us well when you asked the question the first thing that popped into my mind was compassion but unfortunately they're they're preaching to the choir you know those of us who are compassionate toward animals are already compassionate toward animals and the suffering that they're taking on, the personal trauma and the personal disease or illness doesn't seem to be impacting others who, who aren't. Um, and so I feel, I do feel having done this for a while now that there's a lot of unnecessary suffering of animals um, because I don't feel that they are um, having the effect that they, they thought they would have um, on an individual basis, an individual basis. Now, is that to say that the sole family of animals is not coming forward and participating in this great time of transition on earth? Of course, of course that's happening. Um, but individually, there is a lot of unnecessary suffering, I, in my opinion, in my experience, for unique individual animals. Um, now, with respect to animal medicine, where you can buy books or go online and find what is the message from the, ma uh, you know, the, 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 um, oh, the dragonfly, what is the message from the skunk or the coyote, what is the message from the eagle or the deer or the rabbit, such as fear, um, all of that is, is extraordinarily valid. I, I'm in no way trying to invalidate any animal medicine or animal messages. But it is more accurate, I think, from the soul family and from wild animals. Individual animals all express extraordinarily unique medicine, unique gifts and abilities, and unique messages for their owners. Yeah. Well, she's, I think Marmalade is my cat. She's hungry and she's playing with my uh, background right now. <laughs> hey, anyway. <laughs> so you, so you're mentioning that animals taking on some of the trauma of their um, humans. Is there anything we can do as humans to, I don't know, break that bond or help them along to say, you don't have to do this? Is it enough to just say that out loud? What can we do to lighten their load? Well, um, speaking personally, I rescued a dog about six years ago. She was three years old. And when she came to live with us, she was constantly taking on my uh, emotions and trauma. And I, I had to tell her many, many times not to do it. Uh, sometimes animals feel an obligation, especially rescued animals, that they feel obligated to the person who has um, saved their life. You know, they want us to be happy. They don't want us to be sad. They don't want us um, to be angry. So they absorb energy. And I see that a lot. And I see animals especially um, coming down with cancer uh, because it is energy that they've taken on from people in a, in a home environment. Um, I think one of the most important things we can do is take responsibility for ourselves, manage our own energy, try to manage the energy in our home to the best of our ability with whatever tools we have at our disposal, whether that be crystals or sage or water and salt or a meditation or drumming or high vibrational music. I mean, there are many, many uh, different options for us out there. I think to, um, to make sure to let the animals know that we do not consider them responsible for healing us um, would be very important, but we do have to do it more than one time. Mm -hmm. I, I learned that myself because you know my little dog just loved me so much and she wanted to have a job and she wanted to feel important and she felt that that work was important. And so oftentimes we can give them another job, you know, and, and there's not just one or two. There are a lot of different jobs that we might give them. Would, I, would you like me to see if Marmalade wants to say something real sure. quick? <laughs> what color is she? She's black and white. So would, would there be any reason why I'm seeing like an orange tabby cat come yeah, forward? Her name is Marmalade, but she's not orange at all. Have you ever owned a, a cat that was orange? Not yet. <laughs> okay. So, well, 
Let's see what who this orange cat is. Okay, it, it feels like it's a messenger from the soul family of cats. And they're wanting um, to talk about how cats are a little bit different. And um, that I haven't experienced a lot of trauma with cats other than physical trauma. So if someone will say, can you talk to my cat? And I right away feel pain, they were hit by a car or um, they had some type of accident. Um, that type of trauma can affect the cats. And I'm not saying that cats can't, can't have had uh, difficulties, but they are much better at managing their own energy naturally. And that's the message I'm getting right now from this sort of orange striped, almost tabby looking long haired cat that's coming forward. And then it is, it is enough to express this. Um, cats uh, carry a little bit of a different vibration or frequency uh, than, um, than dogs and even horses. And it's very, it's almost magical. It's almost magical just in the way that they purr and the way that they breathe and their vibration. Um, so I think the soul family of cats just wanted to make sure that I didn't lump cats in with dogs in my conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was I guess Mark yeah, wanted you to talk about her and with her, so thank you. <laughs> let, well, let's see, because I'm, I'm not getting anything from, from Marmalade. No. She, this, she has been very happy since the pandemic started. She's <laughs> like having us all around, so yeah. Thank you. I bet. Um, so we're talking about, we've been talking about self-healing and healing. I want to hear from your perspective, what do you mean when you say self-healing or healing? Well, from my perspective, everything is energy. And our healing path follows our intention. But that is an incredibly oversimplified, overgeneralized way of expressing it. Um, it's true, but there's so much more to, to that statement. Our intention, um, our, uh, our presence, our mindfulness, our um, intention to connect with our higher self, all of that guides our journey as well as our original soul path, our, um, the karma that we're here to resolve. In, in most cases, um, a very strong, consistent practice of uh, conscious forgiveness of others can resolve a lot of that and open up a potential or open up the field of possibility um, to create new things, new good and better um, potential for ourselves uh, can, can happen when we uh, embark on a journey, a, a purposeful, intentional, journey of, of forgiveness of self and others. Um, but for, for me, it's all energy. Are there interpersonal relationships? Do we have issues with our family? Have there been people who have harmed us in some ways? Yes, and we are all unique. And um, <clears throat> so we all express all of these things, especially our patterns and our um, uh, triggers, et cetera, from past life experiences. It's all unique. However, intentionally holding uh, space for yourself and a loving space and um, being in, in gratitude and trying to be self-aware and not allowing ourselves to be in, indulging in the drama of humanity and trying to um, uh, become a, a beacon, really, of um, compassion, of of unconditional love and understanding. It's not easy to do, but when we set our intention and we walk that path consistently, it can happen. Yeah, which leads me to, I know you and I talked about this pre-interview a little bit. I, I'm a firm believer in self-healing and um, self-energy um, coherence practices meditation, breathing, yoga, whatever it is for you, or receiving energy healing. 
Um, but then I feel like there comes a point where you might need some assistance or some things may not be as simple as, okay, let me just sit and meditate and be done with it. Can you tell us a little bit about your take on that? Well, the, the way I would answer that is to say, um, the, to share the, the many ways in which I stumbled on my own path. Um, for example, a couple of years ago, maybe three, I, I went to a, a, an intuitive healer or an Akashic Records reader um, more than once who said, oh, you're done with your karmic path. You're moving on to your dharmic path. And the way it was described to me is, oh, suffering is over, karmic consequence is over, now you're expressing your soul purpose. But I didn't understand about um, kama uh, and, and moksha. I didn't understand the totality of the Hindu philosophy and teaching, that there's far more to that. <laughs> there's, you know, on your dharmic path, you may still it, it run into people where you experience karmic consequence or past life entanglement or unforgiveness. And, and that on that path, um, whether you're expressing, you know, a specific religion or spirituality, as you go down the path, you begin to release all of those protocols and dogmas, etc. And I, I think there's a, generally speaking, for those of us who are maybe just learning as I was just learning, I still consider myself to be mis just learning in a lot of ways, but there's a lot of misunderstanding. And then what happens is that um, sometimes we get a little bit taken over by ego. Oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm living my dharma, you know, I don't have to experience karma anymore, you know, not knowing that actually there is a point where we can become aligned with our mind and our soul and, and more in a conscious alignment with our, our soul, our, our higher self. And, um, and that there is a place where we can become detached and um, no longer addicted to suffering and trauma. But I think what's what's happening is that there are so many times where we we almost think, oh, I'm done, I've arrived, <laughs> you know. And and my experience is in every time that I felt that I had arrived, <laughs> there was a whole new level of of healing, and it just presented itself in different ways. And and maybe we had um, less evidence of it in our personal experiences, our behavior, our patterns of speech, our interpersonal relationships. But the deeper you go, you find it's more difficult to heal those subtle patterns that we express because we're using so much of our energy to hold on to it, you know? And so um, I have to be honest, I absolutely forget the question that you asked. I think we're going in that direction. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts about the oversimplification of the healing process mm -hmm. and when to get help from a healer. Right. Um, well, certainly when we feel like the same thing is happening over and over again, and that happened to me so many different ways um, where I might, would it be okay if I just gave a few examples? Of course. Um, so I would, you know, I was always one that I majored in economics. So I always want to understand linear. I want to understand from a linear, how does that work? What does that mean? What is the definition of that? You know, I, I wanted more information and I would go um, to people thinking, oh, look at this amazing person. And I would sort of idolize someone or sort of feel uh, as if they might be a teacher or guru for me. And, and then I would get there and I already was beyond the teaching that was being offered and I would get invalidated over and over again. And so that lesson for me was that I was looking for validation outside of myself, but it would really hurt um, because of course, deep inside of me, there was self doubt, there was a sense of unworthiness. We all have these different types of things. And those types of things for me were very difficult for me to see. If I look at my own energy, I might be able to perceive a past life wound in my elbow or my neck or my legs where I mean, you know, maybe I was a fisherman and I fell off a boat or, you know, a rock fell and broke my neck or something. Those types of things are easier for me to perceive in myself than 
deeply anchored systems of belief of blame or shame. And so when we're on our journey and we, we're working so hard and I'm doing the affirmations and I'm meditating and I'm, you know, I'm doing this work and I'm taking salt baths and I'm doing my yoga and, and you know, I, I, I meet a lot of people that meditate a lot or maybe do Qigong or something and they have this profound opening of their crown chakra and then they're like, ah, I've arrived, you know, but they never really get down into the lower chakras and really dig in there and dig into that heart and find the blocks in the heart. And for those types of things, I really recommend at least every once in a while checking in with someone else. Because if we're still getting sort of smacked in the face or kicked around or, you know, by people outside of us, the message is you didn't learn the lesson yet. And I don't really like it when people say that to me. I, I, so I'm not sure why I just said it that way right now, other than to express that. that it, but there's something unhealed in me that I have not yet identified. So that's how I relate to I haven't learned the lesson yet that there's a wound inside of me or something unhealed inside of me where I'm trying to protect myself and I have certain defense mechanisms or there's self-sabotage or other people keep coming in and triggering me um, to help me realize that I haven't yet found certain energies. And those energies that are difficult for me to find in myself look very crystallized or solidified in, in someone else when I look at someone else's energy, like consistent chronic family trauma, verbal abuse over and over and over, or past life experiences where we just incarnated over and over and over in polarity or where there was um, a, a lot of um, discord between the masculine and feminine, mistrust and unforgiveness and that type of thing. Yeah. So what I want to reiterate from what you just said is that even healers need to see healers sometimes because we need someone to mirror that inner healer to us and to show us in that mirror, maybe like behind your the, the head, the stuff, the things you, not that you don't have the perception to be able to see that you do, but it's, it's a lot harder to do it yourself. And sometimes it, it's not even possible to do it by yourself. Well, you know, certainly I've met so many different kinds of people. I've met people that have only had very few incarnations and they're really happy and they're just expressing joy and they're anchoring the light and they haven't had a lot of trauma and they just went to a Reiki master once and they got all fixed up and they're good to go, you know, and wow, you know, I just, why couldn't I choose that journey, you know, and, and some healers, um, just one modality is all they need you know, um, but for me and for the people that come to me, it's literally like complex PTSD. It's like multiple traumas and a giant Velcro ball just growing and growing and growing and making it difficult to even perceive, to even believe that it's possible to be in a place where we are not suffering. We can't even imagine what that would look like or feel like. And sometimes when it is said, oh, it's just so easy, just go do this or just do tapping or just do Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditation and just retrain your mind and everything will be fine. Not, it doesn't work for every single person. We're all different. And a lot of us healers are on that hero's journey, that wounded hero's journey. And it is an absolute merry-go-round of leveling up and leveling up and leveling up and leveling up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I speak from absolute experience in that, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I think, Ginny, one of the reasons I felt so drawn to you was I'm probably similar in, in the sense of oh, this, um, this new healing method is so shiny and nice and there's something in there for me, even though, you know, I'm not going to be dedicated to it or, or let me look at this. I'm interested in this and bringing all of those together, um, combining those, which I feel is what you do, which brings me to, there's this profound little story that you 
tell on your website um, about one of your horses talking to you about your books, putting down your books. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> right. Um, at, at a certain point on my journey, I just I was fascinated. I was always watching webinars and I was always buying the next book. And what they said to me was, the more you read, the further you go away from us. And the more, and how that works into my experience is the more I rely on a protocol, the less I'm able to witness the truth that is your unique truth. If when I look at you, I expect your truth to manifest in this perfectly defined protocol or system of belief, then we are not honoring the deepest truth of, of us. And it, at a certain point on my journey, I was told, listen, allow us to show you what you need to see so that you can hold a space for either yourself or the other person to release that. But if whatever that particular issue is or experience is or traumatic event is, doesn't show up in my list of one through seven here on, you know, number one, step number one, step number two, if it's not in those steps, then we're not going to be able to perceive it. And that's not to say that I don't still download seminars but one thing that I have shied away from that I did a lot in the beginning, it was all of these shortcut protocols. You know, oh, get, let me get an activation. Let me install an antenna in you. Let me teach you how to um, bring, you know, bring this entity into your chakra and make your chakra work better, <laughs> you know? And I spent a lot of time and money undoing a lot of things that people did to me not knowing that from my perspective, our evolution is getting back to that pure benevolent oneness. And that is to say, from my perspective, in very simple terms, what from my perspective we need to do is unpack all the junk in the trunk and allow us to remember to recreate that which is divinely available to us there isn't an activation or a download or an upgrade that anyone can give us. This is an organic path. There are some people who are choosing an inorganic path to evolution, and that may not turn out very well for people in the long run. It may take thousands of years and hundreds of lifetimes to undo that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, um, I want to ask you, as you're mentioning the word species, when you look at what's happening right now with the pandemic, what do you see us learning as a species at this time? I, I'm not sure that I would uh, couch it in, in that way. I feel as if we are, we have the opportunity to release patterns. One that comes to the forefront of my mind, and I apologize for my dog barking, um, <clears throat> is uh, tribal beliefs. Um, it, it used to be that we had a consciousness, that our consciousness was, was uh, tied to our community and being shunned from our community was a death sentence. Many of us have had lives like that, where we've been cast out of our tribe, right? And um, I feel like this is a, is a great time of opportunity for us to release the patterns of conflict from the past. And, and that is war and um, fear and dogmatic approaches to our understanding, our limitation of ourselves as sentient beings. And I, I feel that it's a great opportunity for us to take the time 
to go deeper and to to dig that out because if just a few of us do it it helps it will help so many more people now that's not to say that there aren't a lot of people suffering you know personally emotionally financially there is a significant amount of trauma but unfortunately we as a race we are creating a lot of that trauma ourselves because we we believe what we were taught when we were young we believe in the societal norms and the education system and um, medicine separate and apart from spirituality. And you almost, you can't blame anyone for believing it. I mean, I had to have a near death experience. To, I would have taken Newtonian physics to the grave with me. You know, I, wouldn't, I didn't know that any of this existed. And so I was blessed with a near death experience that forced me to perceive my reality in ways that I would never have thought possible. And maybe that's what this pandemic is doing for us, is, is forcing us to make a choice. Are we going to continue to go down that path? Or are we going to allow ourselves to heal from the, the burdens and the, the unhealed wounds? And I can, um, I can relate to a, a client I had recently and you know, she, she would talk about, oh, this boyfriend, he did this to me or my father did it and I'm so angry, I'm so angry, I'm so angry. There's a difference between saying that I'm, all of these memories are coming up for me and I want to let them go and I'm in the process of forgiving these people and releasing them and knowing that if I free myself of these burdens that I will free up space <clears throat> you know, to raise my vibration and heal in new and miraculous ways, as opposed to saying, that's right, we're so angry, everything is wrong, we are so disempowered, we don't have a snowball's chance of making a change on the planet. If we can get enough people to believe that we can, and each of us individually just impact our tiny sphere of influence, then collectively the world will have no chance, uh, no, no choice, pardon me, but to, to shift. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I certainly hope that's true. And I, I couldn't wait to get out of bed every morning if I didn't believe that was true. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think we need people who sort of hold that vision too of hope, um, like you said, resolution, relief, and hopefully working through our trauma to come to a place of uh, resolution and other possibilities than just repeating our patterns individually and collectively over and over again. <laughs> so, um, Jeannie, this has been wonderful. Where can people, how can people find out more about you and what you do? My website is heartofthehorse.us. So www heart of the horse.us yeah and i know that you offer um animal healing sessions as well as individual human sessions um, i want to just thank you so much this has been an absolute pleasure for me <laughs> i hope it will be for the people listen as well is there anything else you want to say to our listeners other self healers and healers before we uh finish up well, I would just say, um, you know, that I'm open to talking to anybody for, you know, a reasonable period of time. If someone just wants to talk or um, talk to somebody that's also experienced, you know, hardship and um, to bounce ideas off of, I'm certainly available to try to help to give people options. Because, you know, as we said in the beginning, all roads lead home and and there are many different ways. And more than ever now, um, there are so many different uh, schools and webinars and um, processes for people to use. Yeah, and I, I know that you have a, a, a huge resources list. You, you're listing some of the books that you put aside after a while, but <laughs> it's right. still a good place to start. So we'll definitely, I'll definitely include that link. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thank you for doing the work that you do, talking to animals, helping the animal realm and the human realm. I feel like um, 
you're such an you have an inspirational journey but you're also an inspirational healer in the way that you took that leap even though it took you a while mm -hmm. and it took you perhaps you know trying out a few things to come to where you are but um thank you i appreciate you thanks a lot thank you thank you